The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi there, and welcome from Studio 27 in Sacramento, California, and to our other speakers from Los Angeles to today's webinar, Culture Shock, Shake Up Your Company, Your Store, Your People, and Sales Increases Will Follow. Sponsored by the Friedman Group and hosted by WebAttract, your end-to-end -end solution provider for informational webinars. For those of you that might not be familiar with the Friedman Group, they're an international retail authority and a true thought leader on retail selling and operational management. Hi, I'm Mike Agron. I'll be your moderator and one of your hosts for today's webinar, and we're very excited to get going with the program. Now, let's talk about today's featured speakers. As I said earlier, this is going to be a real treat. Um, Harry J. Friedman and Marlene Cordry will be speaking to you. And Harry is the uh, former owner of two retail chains, and he's an international retail authority. He's a best-selling author and a consultant, and he's probably the most heavily attended speaker on retail selling and operational management in the world today. His book that you can see in the upper right-hand corner, No Thanks, I'm Just Looking, is really considered by many to be the Bible of retail selling. The Goat Star selling course he developed is the world's number one retail selling course, and his public seminars have been attended by retailers representing well over 50,000 stores. He founded the Friedman Group in 1980. It has endured, grown, and prospered. Currently, the company maintains offices in 12 countries and continues to expand its reach internationally. He's always at the forefront of the change on the retail sales floor. He travels the world, he looks for and creates the latest retail sales management processes. His groundbreaking high performance training systems have been used by over 500,000 retailers, both large and small, to routinely deliver more sales. He really is considered to be one of retail's best friends. He's outrageous, and you'll hear that in just a moment, controversial and just plain hairy, but an absolute expert. Delighted to have him. Also, Marlene Cordry, who's the president of the Friedman Group, is also going to participate. Marlene actually uh, joined the Friedman Group, uh, where she worked for uh, Harry uh, in another capacity. As vice president, she was involved in such key areas as the company's sales, training, writing, operations, and general uh, administration controls. Fourteen years and two sons later, she moved with her family back to her roots in Kansas City. So when she rejoined the company in January this year, she came on as vice president. She once again became a significant contributor and brought fresh focus to the company and a strong passion for leadership. Folks, it is indeed my pleasure at this point to turn the controls and the webinar over to Mr. Harry J. Friedman. Harry, welcome to the webinar. Well, Michael, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. We're uh, doing a webinar. I think that's just absolutely amazing the technology today to be able to um, uh, bring a message to so many people so conveniently. I'm sitting here in a little suburb of Los Angeles called Tarzana, California, and um, it's a beautiful day. So welcome, everybody. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, current retail trends, the value and benefits of strong culture, uh, driving that cultural change, and a little bit about uh, technology and the role of it in retail today, not much, and then uh, Marlene and I are going to fend off some questions which, frankly, is the most fun part of the whole thing. Well, here's some brilliant stuff. We're in an economic downturn. Uh, I, I'm sure you needed me to tell you that. Well, that's probably because you are not breathing. I think we pretty much know that. Low consumer confidence in spending industry consolidation and shrinking margins. I want to talk a little bit about, for just a moment, shrinking margins, fighting for market share and Internet growth. They, they have a tendency to um, work together. I'm uh, the big bet in our office is whether or not uh, Christmas will start at, at Halloween this year. Uh, and this actually started well in advance of the Internet uh, uh, striking fear in margins. Um, I, whatever retailers are going to do, they're going to do. I'm a big fan of huge margins, and I'm sure most of you are. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about market share. There are four opportunities to take a look at what your market share, where you are with market share, and this is something that I'm absolutely nuts about today. Uh, the, you, you inherently have a market share, whether you know it or not, and your position is either uh, growing in a growing market, and if we think back to the days when PCs came out and plasma TVs and 
uh, things like that, and the market just expanded like crazy, uh, you would expand, even if you had, let's say, 2% market share, if that market grew, you grew. Uh, conversely, you could uh, maintain a market share in a contracting marketplace. Thirdly, you can expand, which is my favorite part, in a contracting marketplace, or you can contract in an expanding marketplace. The way to know this uh, is to firstly kind of get an idea of what your market is doing, but I'll tell you the thing that I've been paying attention to in the last year more than anything else is the number of transactions you have at retail. This is something that I'm very interested in at store level, uh, district and regional, and, and of course company wide. What are your transactions? Regardless of basket size or average sale, whatever you guys like to call it, um, which I think in some respects are, are fashionable, uh, things, certain things can be popular that uh, carry a higher or lower price tag. It's the number of invoices that will tell you whether or not you're grabbing market share. So that's something I, I really want you to take a look at. Now the Internet. Ah, yes, the Internet. How is that? Well, what fun that's been for brick and mortar retailers. Last year, give or take a couple billion dollars, the Internet did somewhere around $134 billion. And the way I see it, that's $134 billion that was taken right out of the retail arena. So just to let you know, that's not going to change. In fact, it's going to continue to get more and more important as the Internet and the folks that are using it um, uh, find ways to be more intuitive uh, about our shopping experiences. Um, I read an article not too long ago where a lady clicked on a, on a pair of shoes on a site and that pair of shoes followed her, followed her on 34 uh, different websites that she took a look at with ads around it. I thought that was really quite remarkable. Um, and of course, we're seeing an increased reliance on sales and promotions, which is um, kind of unfortunate in a, a, in a way. I, I love to sell things at full pop. In any event, let's get on with the business of culture. And uh, my first thing is, is shopping in your stores a mind-numbing experience for both customers and staff? And frankly, I think it is. I mean, to be perfectly candid, I think that retail is about as boring as it has ever been in the history of uh, retail. As we move away from merchants and go to greeny eye shade guys that, uh, and, and women that, that are looking at return on investment and, uh, and becoming merchandise, solely merchandise companies, um, it's become really, really, really a boring uh, kind of an event to walk into stores. And as we take a look at regional shopping centers, as they become more and more like each other, uh, the, whole, the whole idea of retail is just really getting um, stale. I also ask the question, how fun is it to work on the floor? Or how fun is it to be a DM, RM, or even a C-level executive in your retail organization. Um, I'm not looking for clowns on the floor, but I, I certainly am looking for an environment that has a mood, a beat, and a tempo that says it's exciting to work here. And I wonder if anybody has ever, besides me, ever looked at the amount of uh, money that's being left on the table because of this lack of energy, creativity, and ultimately productivity. At the Friedman Group, we spend an extraordinary amount of time thinking about high performance, whether you are a uh, central cash, large, kind of a big box operation or a, a high-end niche market specialty retailer, there is such a thing as high performance. That is a combination of getting the highest conversion rate possible, the highest basket uh, size in combination with the percentage of repeat customers. Um, one of the things that we've been we've been looking at lately, which is kind of interesting, actually, we we you know we've been in business nearly 30 years, and for some reason or another, we never really looked at this number, and that's the percentage of invoices that are from repeat customers, and we are really looking to grow that number. We're not looking to grow the percentage because we want new customers, but we're really looking to grow the percentage of repeat customer invoices. It is solely the way of telling whether your customer service is any good. And I'll tell you this, that high performance does not have to mean cranky. You do not 
under any circumstances, have to go out and buy plaid pants and speak very quickly to your customers. All right. Let's talk about the value of culture. Leadership provides the thrust that starts the cycle and keeps it going. We define leadership at the Friedman Group as taking people to places that they haven't been. Uh, anything other than that is management. That's okay. I love management. We teach it. We celebrate it. We're in love with the idea of high performance management. But leadership is just a step above it all. It's the ability to take people someplace. It is not a race to the bottom. It is not lowering the bar so you can feel or be, think you're successful. It is truly going out and doing something special. Now, as your leadership grows, and uh, my goodness, if we can get that starting at the top and filtering all the way down to store level, it's a miracle. It is something quite spectacular when you see it. It starts to evolve into an internal perception of your staff members that you've got something special, that you really are cranking it up and uh, uh, dialing the volume to a level that's uh, really quite exciting and fun. That takes in a performance. It always has and it always will. It's your salespeople, your managers, your district managers that feel that, that this, our proposition of what we sell, our value proposition, our unique selling propositions, our merchandise mix, uh, our service, the way the store holds itself is something really terrific that always, always increases performance. When performance goes up, people are happier. Customers understand that they've gone to a place that's special. They want to come back and shop again and again. Uh, word of mouth grows. Salespeople are energized by that, and this circle continues to expand. And I see this as an ever-expanding uh, kind of a rotating uh, delight, especially when it's done very, very well. Well, strong culture, especially when it's a hip, uh, vibing culture, uh, has a way of maintaining much higher standards, lower costs, more repeat business, stronger retention at retail, and I don't think we pay enough attention. Uh, some of the larger organizations that are attending certainly understand from an art HR point of view how much it costs us for uh, to turn a salesperson, uh, and retail uh, turnover rate is um, uh, very, very uh, large. Uh, in some cases, it's 60 to 80 percent, and that's just a very expensive proposition. Greater operational efficiency, we'll talk a little bit about that later on, on stronger discipline, which I am uh, almost religious about. Uh, anybody who knows the Friedman Group knows that you um, could never get a guy to add on if you couldn't get him to take the trash out on time. Improved morale, superior customer service, easier recruiting as a result of people applying, and increased productivity in sales. Well, there are some companies out there that I absolutely love and admire. One of them is Whole Foods. I think they're doing a great job. I think they're, they're, they, they've really got their, their finger on the pulse of what the customers love, certainly in a niche market. I personally love shopping at Whole Foods for a couple reasons. But one of the things that I was thinking about not too long ago is why they installed solar panels on the roofs of their stores. Solar panels are, uh, so, solar panels are expensive. I mean, they really are. And the return on that investment is very, very long term. But the one thing I know about Whole Foods is they walk the walk. And it would be anything less than who they are if they didn't. I think it's amazing. I think that what they have is a vision of a company that serves the customer at a very high level and walks it all the way down to the floor. And I will tell you, there is no chance that when you ask where the olives are, that somebody won't take you there. They don't point. They get it done. So if you haven't been in a Whole Foods lately, knock yourselves out. It's expensive and it's worth it. Now, I have a hobby of making wine, and it's a, it's a great hobby. Frankly, I think it's much better than model airplanes, and I, hopefully you see the, the benefit. And I was really desperately trying to find a way to put grapes into my presentation, uh, solely for my own entertainment. But uh, I have some vineyards in my backyard, and I often think about the different hats that are I wear. One of them is a viticulturalist, which is uh, really giving a bigger name to having a couple vines. 
Uh, but I do care for them, and I, I do uh, make sure that they're in good shape. And then I have another role as an enologist, which is to actually make the wine. I really see a connection between operations and sales. Uh, getting everything prepared to really rock the store. Culture is organic for sure. Given good soil, sun, water, and rootstock, it could possibly develop into something very special. But it requires execution at store level. I've got some points, and I want to get on with talking about the really important things that I want to bring to this webinar. And the first one is the ability to build a strong foundation of process. Process. One of the things that we talk to our clients about incessantly is their foundations uh, in terms of process. I often think of Six Sigma, Lean, uh, Total Quality Management as processes and, and systems that manufacturers have used forever to eliminate deviation and manufacturing defects. We have no such thing in retail. Uh, and I think personally, the, the, the major reason is, is that when you're making a car part, either the part's right or wrong, but when you get to talking about human beings and the frailty and, uh, of humans, that it's a little bit difficult to regulate it, and we certainly don't want robots. Some of the retailers out there are really trying to find a way to get away from actually talking to their customers. I celebrate it, and I'm trying to find a way to talk to them in a more delightful and enchanting way. But I'll tell you what. You can't even get started without foundations, policy and procedures manuals, manager and training programs, uh, uh, sales training programs, uh, all the foundations that you need to really set yourself apart from the crowd. And in the end, you could have these systems and processes. You could. But the bigger question becomes, are they benchmarked? Do salespeople, managers, regionals, district managers, have to pass some sort of competency testing in order to keep their job. Folks, it is time to upgrade the level of competency on our floor and to make sure that we are well documented with best practices. I think that somewhere along the line, you, you, you can get salespeople to say, hi, how are you, and suggest the batteries to go along with a flashlight. I think that's possible. But that doesn't mean that you have a culture where the salespeople truly, and I really mean that, truly care about their jobs, the store, and ultimately the customer and the company. I'll tell you, you can find this out by doing some surveys. We do an a, a employee values assessment form to find out what our salespeople, uh, salespeople are thinking on the floor and then give that same assessment to managers to see whether or not they, they, they have a, a, you know, kind of a beat on, on how the salespeople think. And I'll tell you, there's a huge difference between how the salespeople feel in some organizations the managers feel uh, or know how they feel. Well, uh, here's another question for you. Why do retail organizations choose not to provide world-class customer service and create an atmosphere of high performance? For goodness sakes, it's merely a decision. And as I talk to more and more and more retailers that, are, uh, that have been in business a long time or that are growing and expanding, the more I see that they're going away from caring what's happening on the floor. It's a lot of lip service, but it's not customer service. I think that uh, it's time to start thinking about how the customers feel. And it is not solely about your merchandise mix, your displays, your signage, your store location. Sometimes it's just an organic, good old-fashioned relationship between customer and salesperson. Well, the second point in our driving cultural change, culture shock seminar today is to have and I have in parentheses, make the executive team work on the sales floor. I am calling for every executive and everybody in any position that has anything to do with the stores to work on the floor. I want the CEO, the chairman of the board, if we have to, to spend a day selling. They don't have to manage a thing. Just get on the floor and try to greet a customer, make a demonstration, and add on and take them all the way through a close. The world changes when you get on the floor. Now, I'm a salesperson through and through. 
I love the process of turning shoppers into buyers. I think that the entire retail organization sits on top of that one move. Now, there's no question that I have great respect for merchandise. You can be the greatest salesperson in the world, and if you have something that somebody doesn't want, you're still not going to have sales. But I'll tell you what, most retailers get do a good job of merchandising. But I'll tell you what, <laughs> there is such a disconnect between the CEO's desk and that POS system that it's unimaginable. So why not take a chance, CEOs that are listening in today? Why not take a chance, some of you VP of stores? Why not take a chance, DMs? and get on the floor and mix it up with our customers. It'll change your life. I know it always has changed mine. That common thread of experience needs to connect your management, employees, and customers. It'll be a treat. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about communication in your organization. Chances are very good that it's worth improving. I know that the Friedman Group has stuck struggled with communication it's 30 years I'm sure you do as well I've come across a couple things lately that have really enchanted me uh, there are online services like social go that's just one of them uh, that are social networks and dissemin uh, disseminators of, of information in your company a lot of you are large and have intranets but you know intranets are usually uh, are usually controlled by someone upstairs that has no sense of humor and no sense of social fun. Um, we, we have no such constraints at the Friedman Group. We, I'm a nutcase and so are most of the employees. So we got onto the site called Social Go. It's all Friedman. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, our licensees. We, have, uh, we're, we operate in about 12 countries. It uh, gives them an opportunity to ask us questions about our content or uh, maybe client bases. Uh, we send happy birthday messages on this, videos, uh, product knowledge. Uh, it's really a, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I really suggest that you start thinking a little bit outside the box. Certainly, everybody's aware of social media. I hope you are. Facebook, tweeting. Uh, I tweet uh, when I have something to say or whatever. I maintain a Facebook page, certainly for the company. Um, God, I hope you'll jump on something like this. It's really great for esprit de corps. All along this line of thinking, the question again, another question is, what opportunities do you provide for your staff to get together as a group outside of the workplace to build spirit? I mean. For goodness sakes, all your employees get along, don't they? I mean, I know all of my employees do. They all share so many things in common. Well, we all know that's not true. But in fact, bowling is cool. So is miniature golf, playing baseball, and all sorts of things that you can do to get your company grooving together. Well, I have a poll question. Michael? Let's see if we can get some people to vote on this. Do you, you provide uh, funding on a regular basis for a spree de corps at store level? We'd sure love it if you all would vote on this. Okay, so we have 35% uh, uh, of the people say they do provide funding and 65% no. Thank you for the, uh, hopefully the truthfulness of this. Um, we're going to get back to all of you personally who voted uh, no. I, I'm just kidding. We don't know who, who that is. All right, Michael, let's get on with this. Well, I want to show you something we did not too long ago. We had a group of people uh, get together, uh, a, a portion of the company, and um, we had a meeting about something that somebody thought was important. Uh, you know how meetings are. And um, in Friedman style, I decided to do something uh, interesting for the group. And we put on a Top Chef competition. We had aprons made with our logo on it saying Top Chef competition. It was remarkable. We gave them uh, a very small amount of money. I think it was $30 and, uh, as a team. And they had an hour and 15 minutes. They actually had to go to the grocery store and uh, buy things, cook. Uh, believe me, the kitchen was a mess. But the food was terrific. 
Uh, we had some great recipes, and the, the esprit de corps couldn't have been better. There were all, we, we, we find a way somehow or another to uh, create teams of people that normally wouldn't be teammates, and I think that's really something terrific. So these activity groups um, that we establish um, are really uh, more important than most organizations really um, uh, provide. I was thinking not too long ago uh, when talking to one of my clients at the Friedman Group that, um, uh, well, they were telling me that they were opening their 25th store or something like that. And uh, at the same time, I, I knew very well that they provided no funding for Esprit de Corps, nothing for activities, nothing for incentives, games, contests. And I was just wondering, if, if they didn't spend the half a million dollars to open up that 25th store and took that half a million dollars and rerouted it into creating an environment where the sales staff, managers, district managers, regional managers would enjoy the job, doing things to create some excitement, that they would make more money on the increased productivity in the existing stores that they had than they would ever in a hundred lifetimes by opening the 25th store. That I know for sure. I am nuts about rewards, contests, games, incentives. You don't need to spend much money. You don't have to have a big budget. You just have to think this way. Folks, it is time to create this kind of an excitement, and it has nothing to do with their paycheck. Well, Michael, it's poll time again. Let's see how often our friends out there in webinar land run contests, games, or challenges. This one's a little different, I think. Yes, it is. And I just launched it. Just choose one, folks, uh, one per month, four times per year quarterly, or more frequently than four times per year. And we'll share the results in just a moment. You should have the results up now. I do have the results. So 26% um, of the people do it. Uh, more frequently than four times a year, and, and the vast 46%, uh, which is the vast majority, do it four times a year. Wow. All right. Um, let's go back to the screen here. Yikes. All right, put your wrists out, everybody, so I can smack you. Folks, you're killing me. You're boring me to death. Let's have some fun. Let's get some music in the store. Let's get some mood, some tempo. Let's get it going. So to that end, Number five is to implement plenty of selling games, contests, and incentives. I wrote, oh, I don't even know how old it is now. It seems like a couple lifetimes ago when I uh, was trying to come up with some games for a client, and I kind of ran out. We, we did a little research. It took us almost two years to put it together. We put together uh, the complete book of contests and games. We have over 100 selling games. Look, I just absolutely love the idea that there is something going on in that store more than just talking to customers. The involvement in being on a team, one store challenging another, one district saying to another district, we could take you out. This is the kind of fun that retail is all about uh, and can be all about without exception. A fun environment is terrific in any kind of business, but when you're in the retail business, you're in show business. Customers have a ticket and you put on a show, and when you do that, and when you increase the esprit de corps, when people are included and you run lots of contests and games, magic happens, I want to talk for you, with all of you for just a second about inclusion. Whether you like them or not, Apple stores have really rocked it. They are doing a great job. Not everybody in the world can... Uh, have 3,000 square feet for four items. I mean, I, there's no question about it. They, they, they do something quite remarkable. Um, but I've known a couple people that work at Apple, and I'll tell you, there is, you are an Apple person or you are not an Apple person. Uh, you're a Whole Foods person or you're not. You're a Trader Joe's person or not. There's so, there, you're a Les Schwab, uh, Schwab up in the Pacific Northwest person or you're not. These are companies that have it going. And I know at the Friedman Group, all of our employees proudly wear a Showtime pin, letting people know that 
we believe that there's a little bit of showbiz in every retail transaction. Um, either it's satisfying with a standing ovation or they're walking out after the first act. It's quite amazing. You know, your store managers, well, they're probably already working a ton of hours per week. I know the good ones do. So who's going to spearhead and maintain a cultural change in your stores? Is it going to be you? Is it really? Hmm. Well, I'm going to tell you, I would create a C-level position called Chief Culture Officer. I mean, for goodness sake, I mean, if you read any of uh, the, uh, the academic, academia on business today. I mean, I, I don't know. The, the, the title VP no longer exists. They're, everybody's a C-level everything. I, 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 it's, it's amazing to me. So why not? I am so crazy about creating a culture of performance and inclusion and esprit de corps that I want somebody at the highest level of the company looking after its culture. As companies get larger, as the dollars become more important as locations become the project du jour as we are searching for the next hula hoop we take our eye off the ball I need somebody to keep their eye on the experience at store level so you know what why not go for it chief culture officer somebody who really loves people and loves to make sales Gee, anyway what I was ranting and raving about was the constant tug of war between ops and sales which seems to never go away uh, and um, I in my opinion is and uh, having been in more retail stores than maybe anybody on the planet uh, I think ops is winning and it's a shame because I'd really love to see sales winning uh, no one doesn't want the store to be absolutely perfectly disciplined planograms in place cash being deposited on time and the papers picked up off the floor. But I'll tell you what, if that's your operating mode solely and you're not thinking about whether or not your customers are smiling when they leave the store, I don't think you have it exactly right. We can get that done. It's a matter of willingness on behalf of senior management to play a game of customer experience. One of the things that we're calling for today more than ever before is an appointed sales manager now some of the people that are listening in the seminar have four have four people in the store there's no way they can afford a separate sales manager for manager some of you are very large but somewhere along the line someone has to wear that hat somewhere along the line a retail organization needs to realize that it's not just a matter of giving someone a job responsibility or a hat and expecting that they'll do it. It's not quite like that. Baseball, football, soccer, all major league sports have a coach that's constantly there. They're on the sidelines. They're cheering on their players, keeping the discipline, motivating them, and making things go right. I believe we are in a similar situation. Someone has to be on the floor in the year 2010 someone needs to be running it and someone needs to make it an exciting environment in which to work it's that or we have two people at 845 at night texting their friends on getting out of work five minutes early you gotta be kidding me it's gotta be better than that one of the things that I like to do is, is uh, and I'm sure most of you do is like look at the numbers and one of the things that I like to identify is a B and C salespeople gold silver bronze right generals lieutenants and sergeants however you want to do it um, and what I try to do is try to find the difference between top producers not your alien your number one guy or, or, or gal but certainly your top producer range and then I take a look at the low producer range and it doesn't take much just a little subtraction of subtracting your poor producers from your big producers and you know what in this particular case we're looking at a slide that says five hundred and three hundred thousand at the low end that's two hundred thousand dollars and I believe without a shadow of a doubt that that two hundred thousand dollars that's being left on the table is a choice somewhere along the line 
somebody in the organization has chosen to leave that person on the floor and have them continue to produce at a subordinate level. I don't think it's acceptable. I think we could do something about it. And I think we can get really good at getting people who want to come to work for us and produce at a high level. So what would happen if all of your salespeople produced at a very high level? Well, it would be a miracle. <laughs> it would be unbelievable. It would be the game to play. There are a lot of variables out there, like store location, demographics, uh, and, and, and a variety of other things that influence sales for sure. How would you really know? How would you really know? Well, one of the things that we love to do is test our organizational's metal or our full potential. Uh, and to that end, we love to create what's called a SWAT team. Now, a SWAT team is one of the more amazing ideas that I've come up with. Uh, SWAT can be looked at a couple different ways. I guess in business they call it strengths, weaknesses, and threats. Uh, and we know it certainly from a police action <laughs> standpoint, we know what it means. Uh, on this one, it's more along the lines of strengths and weaknesses. Uh, many years ago, I had a, a chain of stores. When I took over the chain, one of the stores that I had was producing at a very low level, around $50,000 a month. I uh, had asked the general manager to uh, have the staff take uh, a day off, and uh, he and I just, and it's a small organization, we had five salespeople uh, total, we, everybody, we, we, we had them take the day off. Uh, this guy and I, the general manager and I, went in to work that floor that day, and it was remarkable to me that from a store that was doing 50000 a month, the two of us did 50000 that day. That's a very well-documented story that I'm very proud of. And I'm more proud of the fact that I discovered that we had an immense problem with our staff. Uh, subsequently, we changed it around and uh, got that store with a staff that it could be proud of and the consumers and everybody could be proud of. And that store went from 50000 a month or about 600000 a year to $2.1 in one year. That's what's possible. We knew it. I ask you. Before you do anything radical with one of your stores, why not send in an A-team? Why not get a group of salespeople that really know what they're doing, a group of managers, and go in and take over for three, four, five days? And in very short order, short order, you will know whether that store is underproducing because of its staff or some other outside variable. I went into a Home Depot the other day and had the most remarkable experience. Uh, one, I was um, left alone, um, and they're so good at that, really. I mean, and, and, and most of, of folks, big box places are similar to that, so I don't want to just highlight them. I actually went in, bought some nuts and bolts, checked myself out, and never talked to a human being in the entire experience. Well, you know what? I thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of hip. Uh, it was kind of current. It was kind of technological. It was really great. Now, I must admit, the nuts and bolts had no, I, no way of adding on to each other, and the uh, machine that scanned me and checked me out didn't smile and say thank you very well. But you know what? Uh, there's a place for it. But if you have decided that you want to have human beings, well, it's a very cool thing because you can, in fact, create an experience. Now, Prada stores, uh, their fitting rooms display detailed information about customer items and related products. It is unbelievable what's happening. Charming shops, Lane Bryant, Fashion Bug stores have booths that measure customers using radio waves with over 200,000 data points. There's a company that we know that uh, has an infrared system uh, that tracks customers uh, uh, from the minute they walk in the store to the minute they leave. And we know exactly where the customer goes. We track their path. We actually know what they reach for. And the retailers are now charging vendors extra money to be in preferred locations based on this data. Wow, this is really cool. I mean, we, 
we are going to be able to do frontal lobotomies on customers, it seems like, before they buy a pair of socks. But we can't get Johnny to stop saying, can I help you? And he's really interested in dashing out early instead of working a little extra to make that store that much more special. Ah, we even got better than that. We have salespeople on headphones now. Can you imagine that? I really believe that the headphones are to signal each other that, that there's a customer in the store, and if they can avoid them at all costs, it, it would be good. I don't understand this at all. Headphones on salespeople? Wow. Well, I love technology. There's no question about it. I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of the fact that we're doing a webinar to people all over the world. I'm a big fan that when I go to an Apple store and they have the cash register in their hand I'm, and the, the salesperson never has to leave me and says, would you like me to email your receipt? I love this stuff. Uh, I think it's really quite remarkable. And I love the fact that Whole Foods uh, sells me a bag. Can you imagine? They sell me a bag to put the groceries that I bought in their store so that they don't have to provide uh, you know, uh, bags and, and it's great for the environment. And I love the fact that Costco won't give you a bag. So I, they won't even sell you one. So I'm not so sure we <laughs> I act together on all this stuff. This is really quite amazing. Well, folks, there were some points there that I hope you enjoyed. And I hope I bothered some of you. Um, that's kind of what I like to do. You know, the Friedman Group and its staff members have for 30 years been dedicated to uh, finding great, way, great ways to operationally run your store. I have a great passion for retail. I love salespeople, managers, and DMs. I love what they can bring to the party. I hope you have that passion as well. Yes, you are in business, but this isn't manufacturing. It's retail. And, hope it's no surprise, it's a people business. Retail has a promise that absolutely needs to be kept. Thank you very, very much, Harry. For additional information and resources, take a look at what's up on the screen. Uh, you can contact the Friedman Group at 310-590-1248. There's their uh, email or uh, website above that. And... There's other terrific resources that you're able to uh, tap into, and one of the things about the website is that in celebration of their 30th anniversary, there's a very, very special offer right now on the remaining uh, seminars for the fall. Carrie and Marlene, please come back to the uh, virtual panel, and let's open it up uh, for questions. And as I said, there's quite a few in the queue. Harry, I'll turn it back to you. Fabulous. Michael, a lot of people, a lot of people that, are, that seem to be... Uh, Perked, perked their interest when you were talking about a cultural officer. And in particular, Jordan has asked, how large does your organization have to be to justify a special position at, as a chief cultural officer or even a sales manager? Well, there's a two... Well, Marlene, how are you? I'm fine. How are you doing? Well, you've been... Doing wonderful here. Well, thank you so much. I do pay her an extraordinary amount of money to say things like that. Well, this is a great question, actually. And um, here's the thing. In small organizations, you don't actually have to hire somebody additionally to do or wear that hat. Somebody just has to wear that hat. So here are the things. People can do multiple jobs without any problem at all. It's just that the job has to be defined and benchmarked. Okay. So if you can benchmark the job of cultural officer, which you can by employees' opinions and surveys and a variety of other things, uh, even customer surveys, you, you, can, you can get around the kind of benchmarking that. So uh, anybody in the organization uh, can do that job. Um, and of course, as, the, uh, as, as you grow and get larger uh, and start to try to figure out what this is going to mean to you in your bottom line, you can afford to put that post on. Same thing with sales manager. Frankly, in small organizations, the manager is the sales manager. All we're saying is that there has to be a dedicated amount of time that somebody is on the floor running it. And even if the manager can't be running the floor, somebody has to be in charge of running the floor every opening hour that that store is running. 
Okay, well, here's a related question that comes from Lisa on the same subject. She wants to know what would the job description of chief cultural officer include? Well, it's a great question. Uh, there, there's some uh, room for movement on this. Um, the, the, the most important statistic for a chief cultural officer would be a turnover rate of salespeople. Okay? So that's the, the first statistic. The second statistic would be uh, the number of applications that were coming in unsolicited to the company. Uh, that's another statistic. So it's, it's not what a Johnny, how many times Johnny jumped up and down per minute. It's really a matter of the stats that uh, show us that we have a company that people want to work for and customer satisfaction as well. So there, there, there are a couple different angles that I would look for. In terms of the nuts and bolts of the whole thing, um, there's a variety of things. Uh, we talk about esprit de corps, uh, cultural events, uh, you know, outside activities, uh, willingness to participate, uh, contributions to the company above and beyond what they're paid for. There's a, there are a variety of things. I, I, I've never had two alike that w w when we created them because a lot of it has to do with the willingness of senior executives to uh, do something very different. Now I've got, a, I've got a great question here from Tyler, and uh, I think a lot of people might be thinking this as well given the current economic situation. He wants to know how do you boost morale or performance in a company that is continually cutting hours, payroll, benefits, uh, so that the employees literally have to hold two jobs just to make a living anymore? Thanks for the question, Tyler. I hope you don't get bored by my answer. You can't. End of that story. Well, all righty then. Uh, I've got another great one here, too, from Cheryl. She wants to know, how long does it take to achieve a cultural shift? Okay, I'm, I want to apologize for the answer to Tyler. Look, Tyler, here's the thing. Um, you, you, you know, companies that, that are suffering sales decreases and, and chasing last year's numbers, I mean, the first things that go are advertising and, and, and hours. I mean, the two very things, the, the blood flow to the heart, it's like a heart attack. I mean, the, the first thing you need, you need is some bodies walking in the store, and then you need somebody to do something with that customer to build basket size and some sort of loyalty. So if we're cutting the very things that give us blood flow, I don't know how you can win. Now, look, it is tough out there. Um, the, the only answer that I have is, you can cut the staff so long as the staff that remains are top producers. Um, but I would cut only the hours of those people that can't live up to the uh, you know, expectation that we have. All right, so that next question was, <laughs> I forgot already. I was, I was so uh, amazed by my answer. How long does it take to achieve a cultural shift? I love that question. In reality, the, any kind of major behavioral change in an organization uh, takes about two years, frankly. Um, and that is if you're at it, uh, you're, if you're really constantly at it, then it could change in, in about two years. Uh, it, frankly, it'll never change unless you're at, you know, you're really going after it. But we find about two years. Now, why two years? Well, it sounds like a good number. But, but frankly, it's really based on, um, believe it or not, turnover of salespeople. New salespeople have a tendency to want to join in the fray more than some old timers who already have preconceived notions of the company and are unwilling to change. So about two years gives you enough of a turnover of, of existing staff uh, under the new kind of philosophies. And uh, if you keep at it, you can expect to be a very different company in about two years. We find the same thing with our productivity improvement programs where we uh, work with goals and objectives and metric analysis and coaching on the selling floor. Okay, I don't know how many more questions we're going to fit in here, but this one is really a follow-up to this. When do you start experiencing a return on investment of this cultural shift? Well, it, return on investments can be as fast as the attitude of the salespeople on the floor change. Um, tomorrow afternoon, Johnny can suggest more items, be more engaged, want to help the company more, and, uh, and go for it. Um, to the degree that you want to change and get a return, on investments to the degree that you'll get it. There's no question about it. Now, we're not solely looking at uh, a C-level uh, executive uh, creating $562,500. Uh, 
This is first and foremost a belief system. The executives of the company have to believe that until their employees love working there, they will never get as much money from each customer as they potentially could. They'll never reduce the turnover rate of employees as much as they could. So all these things are part and parcel, but it really uh, is a matter of, of the desire of, of, of upper management to create uh, an environment where this kind of success can uh, incubate and then finally grow. All right, we've got another one from Randy who uh, sounds like he's feeling the pain from the Internet. He says, with over 60% of our business down, now done through the Internet, how do you combat the discounting that is going on to maintain margin? Well, hey there. Uh, we certainly feel your pain. Uh, that's not really related to our subject matter today, but ah, what the heck. I can give you my best answer. If you sell the things that people are selling on the Internet, you're going to feel the pain for the rest of your life. Uh, folks, the Internet is a very efficient, fast, inexpensive way to buy and sell merchandise. It's not going to change. It's only going to get uh, more, uh, more of the same. Um, so uh, why not try selling some things that are not easily attained? But uh, my, my classic answer has always been the same, and that is that uh, the first thing I want to know is what your conversion rate is uh, at store level uh, and what your basket size is. Now, given that, one has to understand the true calling of retail, and that is passion. You know what? I'm always willing to spend 5 bucks or 10 bucks more if somebody gets excited about it in the store and give me a good reason to buy it today. I don't want to wait a couple of days. I'm still of the mind that if I could touch it and feel it and take it home with me, then I'm all over it. Um, here's some basic truths. If we were to take a look at the merchandise of the, the excuse me, the tenant mix in a typical regional center uh, today versus uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, you'd see a completely different mix. Uh, years ago, you would see as much as 11 or 12 percent of the shopping center stores, jewelry stores. Well, who in the world needs 10 or 15 jewelry stores in a shopping center anymore? So we are reducing and culling out all of the pro retailers and non-professionals in retail in high rent places and even in uh, not so much low rent places. They're just going out of business or self, not because of rent. Guys, if you're to remain, you have to be good. And if you're not doing the due diligence to become a top flight retailer that creates a certain passionate response at retail, then you're not going to make it. Um, you, you probably don't want to be a travel agent today. So that's about all I can say about it. Now, I'm not sure if this is the same Randy, but if so, I've got another good one from him. He asks, how do you define culture in a specialty retail store where we're selling similar products to our competitor, is adopting the Friedman culture a unique selling proposition? Hey, Randy, how are you? So let, let me give you some dictionary definitions. Kind of fun. Culture could, and there's many, so I'll just pick the one that's most appropriate. Uh, culture can be defined as the development of special training or care, the skills, arts, and so forth, of a given people in a given period. All right? Now, if we were to go to define culture shock, it's the alienation, confusion, etc., that may be experienced by someone encountering new surrounding, a different culture, etc. This is all very cool stuff. Randy, unique selling propositions uh, are not necessarily culture unless the culture is so remarkable that it's worth ta talking about. When we talk about uh, uh, culture as unique selling propositions, we could talk about, uh, I mentioned them earlier, less. Schwab up in the Pacific Northwest, they sell tires. They have a little thing where they run out to your car when you drive on the lot. They actually run out. And it's actually quite famous. Uh, they also have a thing where they uh, will uh, fix your tire if it goes flat. Now, that's a unique selling proposition. Uh, that service, that's not necessarily culture. So you have to define both. Culture is not necessarily a unique selling proposition. Um, I don't know your business. Um, you feel free to contact us and we can talk about unique selling propositions, but um, this may not exactly be the form. It is rare, but it can happen where the culture of the company becomes the unique selling proposition. This is a question that we have, we, several people have asked this in one way or another, uh, and it's a good one, really good one. What questions do you ask your staff to find out what they think the culture of their store is? 
Well, I'm going to make this easy for you. If you uh, drop us a note at the Friedman Group, um, we will um, send you out an employee assessments form. And it's kind of fun uh, with some instructions on how to use it. And uh, we don't verbally ask anybody because, frankly, um, it could be uh, mood du jour. But um, we actually have an organized form that uh, tests the uh, waters and lets us know how our employees are feeling. Uh, but once again, let me go back to the basics. It's a matter of turnover rate. People don't leave one job for another for a buck an hour. They leave because they want an opportunity to see to grow and expand. So there's lots of things along this line. Is there a career path? Is there recognition? Is there an opportunity to contribute? Uh, does anybody listen to me? All those things are all part and parcel of the things that you want to assess formally in uh, getting a, a mood and a, a beat uh, of your employees. Now let's look at a question from Rebecca. She says, how do you get a small business manager to hold people accountable when training is so extensive and costly and we don't want more turnover? Well, I think I've become famous for one line. Uh, we even have it at the Friedman Training Center in Las Vegas, and it says, what if I train my people and they leave? And then the retort is, what if you don't train them and they stay? Uh, it's a cost of doing business. Uh, don't ever worry about somebody leaving. Um, you, you, that's part of the interview process. Don't put anybody on board that you're not willing to commit uh, a, a certain amount of, of your resources and your love and care to. I, you just got to go for it. You've just got to have the best trained guys in town. They have to be just drilled on product knowledge and customer service skills and operational prowess. They've got to be good. It's, it's what you have. We have the choice to have great people. We may not actually, you know, you can't always buy right, but you can always sell right. Why not give it a go? Um, you already are doing what you're doing, but the idea of taking salespeople to a high level of involvement and knowledge to me is so exciting. Some miraculous things can happen, and we've seen it throughout time in retail. There's been some amazing amazing retail success stories. Now this next question is from Libby and she wants to know if foundation is so important how do you get people excited about writing and creating procedure and training programs? It seems like dry stuff but so necessary. I don't you know I mean is it dry stuff for a doctor to put a stethoscope to hear your heartbeat? I suppose that's dry stuff when he might prefer to do cardiac surgery. Um, it's exciting to know that when your foundations are set, that you can replicate and grow your business. Uh, I can't tell you the number of retail clients that we have that are now stuck with 15 or 16 or 18 or 20 stores and didn't get those foundations stuck uh, into the company. They're, they're in, it is very difficult to retro customer service and foundations. The best time to do it is now. Why is it dry? Why is sales training and, and policy and procedures dry? Well, because it's dry. I mean, you know, brief belief is dry. But you know what? When you run into your first guy that wants to take 10 days off because his brother-in-law's cousin's sister's aunt's uh, friend died, well, then you're going to know that it was you should have written that policy. So it's cool. Okay, I think this is the last question we're going to have time for uh, from Perry. We all know that a large percent percentage of our in-store traffic is made up of browsers. Is it realistic to convert these customers into clients and not turn off these browsers by appearing too aggressive? Wow, I don't even know. Well, thanks, Marlene, for uh, the, the bonus question of all time. Oh, is this Perry? Perry? Perry, you're going down on this one, buddy. First of all, um, I don't go into about 95% of the stores in any shopping environment because I have no interest, no inclination whatsoever for the merchandise. I believe, and I have proven without a shadow of a doubt, that if somebody walks in your store, they have a conscious, subconscious, for goodness sakes, even an unconscious desire to buy what you have. So let's go ahead and start with a premise that everybody is going to buy. We're just not good enough to take their money. It's called salesmanship. The way we approach customers, the mood, the beat, again, how we've set it up is 
what it's all about. I've seen conversion rate double by teaching people how to sell, sell, and um, I just think you need to dip into finding what's going on on the floor in terms of greeting customers, probing, making demonstrations. Look, aggressiveness is only a matter of bad management and bad manners. Welcoming, I got it, I got it, Perry. Here's one. A buddy of your, somebody knocks on your door of your front house, an old buddy of yours. Do you greet him, or do you just let him walk around trying to find interesting things in your house to take a look at? Look. This is your business home. We want to welcome people with friendly greetings that are from the heart and that are, that are truthful. It's not a sales tactic at best. It's a matter of welcoming at best. And if your salespeople are bored to death and are required to greet a customer within 15 seconds for some reason or not required to greet customers at all, on either end of the spectrum, you're in trouble. So take my advice. The people that walk into your store want to buy. You just got to get your level of salesmanship to a level where they will buy and want to shop with you again. There's great hope for you, Perry. I'm betting on you, buddy. I think just to speak to this a little bit more, I I have uh, I'm one of the few living human beings he likes to refer to me as that has actually worked on a retail floor with Harry Friedman, and the conversion rate in this store and it was jewelry, by the way. The conversion rate in this store was 83 percent. Now, those of you in jewelry out there, you're, you're, you're not believing it right now, I'm sure, but I'm telling you it was 83%. We were aggressive in that store, no, no doubt, but there was no more fun store to walk into in the entire mall. It was, it was buzzing. It was fun. You could feel it the moment you walked into it. Uh, and a lot of that, most of that, was uh, Harry Friedman's influence and and the way he kept things uh, constantly. There was a challenge. He was calling a store manager on a, every Saturday morning. A store manager got called, and there was a challenge. There was constantly a, a challenge to a salesperson to see if you can go sell something to that customer. But it was fun. It was absolutely a ball. Well, you, you, there's a lot of things that go into that conversion rate that you mentioned, Marlene. We had an extremely high turnover rate of um, customers, meaning that if I couldn't make the sale, I would turn it over to somebody else. We had a lot of team selling going on and a lot of communication and a lot of other things. Be that as it may, um, there's a lot of hope out there. I am not giving up on retail. I'm actually celebrating it today for people to get better at it, to know it more. We have done more for retail in creating the Internet e-tailing thing, more technology and, and more attention has been paid to how to e-tail in the last four years than has had in the last 50 years on the selling floor. Come on, folks. Let's do it. I'm ready to have some fun. Well, Mr. Agron, who is the host, I want to thank you very much for uh, putting this together for it. WebAttract, you're a great company. Anybody who wants to do webinars should be contacting you, I can tell you that. Your professionalism uh, uh, has, has been appreciated and the joy to work with you for sure. Marlene, you're still the best. And uh, for all my friends out there in retail, I hope all of your problems are small, but all of your sales are big, and I certainly hope to see you on the road sometime. Thank you, Harry, for coming from the heart and really providing one of the most incredible webinars I've ever had the pleasure of hosting, and Marlene for supporting Harry and us in this endeavor. It's been fantastic. I thank you all in the audience for giving us the extra time. We still have more questions, and as we mentioned at the top of the webinar, the Friedman Group will be getting back to you with a response. Everybody, have a great rest of the week, and thanks again so much for joining us and to the Friedman Group. Bye for now.